Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture in our ECG course. Our lecture today is titled Atrial Enlargement and this is the first lecture in the topic of chamber enlargement in ECG. And we are going to focus today on atrial enlargement itself and so our ILOs today in this lecture is to understand why P wave is normally biphasic in V1 lead which is important for us to understand the left atrial enlargement itself and to understand how to detect and diagnose right atrial and left atrial enlargement in ECG. Needless to say, to check for atrial enlargement we look at the P wave voltage and morphology since the P wave represents atrial depolarization. So all what we are going to speak today is regarding P wave not complex or the T wave. Of course, we need to start with the normal parameters of P wave. So we need to remind ourselves that in order to comment on a P wave, we need to look at the morphology, duration, amplitude, and axis. Regarding the morphology, normal P wave usually usually shows a smooth contour, usually monophasic in lead two, and in most of the ECG leads, and it is biphasic in V1. Regarding the axis, we know of course that the normal P wave originates from the SA node, which lies in the right upper quadrant of the heart and so the axis is directed towards the left lower quadrant and so we could expect the axis to be between 0 degree to plus 75 degrees so P wave would be positive in lead 2, 3 and AVF and it would be negative in AVR and we explained this before in the ECG interpretation lecture. Regarding the duration, usually P wave is shorter than 120 millisecond and so it is usually shorter than 3 small squares. And regarding the amplitude, it is less than 2.5 mm in limb leads and less than 1.5 mm in precordial leads. So the reference values for normal P wave is a P wave duration less than 120 milliseconds, P wave amplitude less than 2.5 mm in limb leads, P wave amplitude less than 1.5 mm in precordial leads, especially V1 and V2, and the amplitude of the negative deflection of the biphasic P wave should be less than 1 mm in V1. Of course, we need to remind ourselves that sometimes you may normally see a negative P wave in V1 without a positive deflection. This is considered a normal variant and so you should not consider this as abnormal. Of course, we need to ask ourselves a question regarding normal atrial depolarization. Do right atrial and left atrial depolarizations occur simultaneously or not? In order to understand or to answer this question, we need to explain how atrial depolarization starts. We know, of course, that starts from the SA node, which is present in the subepicardial layer in the right atrium, and goes to the left atrium, so the Pacman's bundle, and it will go through the internodal tracts to the AV node and then to the ventricle to start ventricular depolarization. So, of course, atrial depolarization, as it goes from right to atrium, theoretically, it will depolarize the right atrium before the left atrium and it would summate to form the P wave. And so, of course, if we divide the P wave into three thirds, the first third of the P wave correspond to right atrial depolarization, the final third correspond to left atrial depolarization, while the middle third represents a combination of the two depolarization. And in most leads, these two forms of depolarization move in the same direction, forming a monophasic P wave. However, sometimes you may normally see two humps in some individuals. But in most ECG leads, it would be monophasic. And in lead 2, as we see here, because lead 2, its positive pole lies at positive 60 degree. So we expect that, of course, the P wave would be positive and monophasic in lead 2. So the answer to this question, yes, right atrial depolarization start before left atrial depolarization, but with a very short time interval. What about the precordial leads? Of course, in order to understand this, we need to imagine the image on your right hand side. On your right hand side, you could see a transverse section in the right atrium and left atrium showing two together. The right atrium, of course, as an anterior structure, it, is, it would be directed towards the V1, and left atrium as a posterior structure, it would be directed posteriorly and to the left side, more near to the V6 lead. Okay, so we know, of course, that depolarization as we mentioned before start from the SA node depolarizing the right atrium and then depolarizing the left atrium so the Pacman's bundle. So right atrial depolarization of course in V1 it would be directed near to the positive pole of V1 so we could expect that right atrial depolarization would lead to, would lead to a positive deflection in V1 whereas left atrial depolarization is directed away from the positive pole of V1 and so we could expect that V1 show a biphasic pattern 
with a second negative deflection which is less than one millimeter because lift iterate depolarization is directed away from the positive pole and we remember the basic rules of ECG is that if the electrical activity is directed away from the positive pole of the ECG lead it will lead to a negative deflection so this explains why V1 is biphasic in uh, why the P wave is biphasic in V1 in normal condition regarding V6 it is much more simple Right iterative depolarization would be near to the positive pole of V6, and also left iterative depolarization would be near to the positive pole of V6. So we could expect that V6 showed totally positive P wave and monophasic pattern without any biphasic appearance. In order to like make a conclusion about the normal iterative depolarization and normal P wave morphology, we use usually two simple ECG leads, which are lead two and lead V1. In lead two, as we mentioned before, P wave would be positive and monophasic and in lead v1 it would be biphasic and we explained why it is biphasic in v1 now we understand the normal iterative depolarization and this explains to us the normal parameters of p wave let's go to the abnormal condition the first thing is the lift atrial enlargement as we expect from the terminology it is a problem or the pathology in the left atrium, so it would affect the left atrial depolarization rather than the right atrial depolarization. So this would be affected and this will lead to an affection in the P wave parameters. So if we use an imaginary vertical line dividing literally the P wave into a portion representing right atrial depolarization and another portion representing left atrial depolarization, we could expect that right atrial depolarization would be the same, whereas left atrial depolarization of course would be accent weighted as the uh, lift iterative depolarization is increased so the p wave duration in lead 2 would be increased and it can usually show two humps as we see here and the negative component in v1 would be accentuated more than one millimeter depth so the biphasic pattern in v1 would be much more accentuated with lift atrial enlargement so Enhance a second hump with prolonged P wave duration lead to enhance a negative deflection more than one millimeter in V1 leads to a diagnosis of lift atrial enlargement. Let's see this on the surface ECG. This is the pattern that we can see, and here on your right hand side, you could see that there is normal, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, increased P wave duration lead to with two humps, and the two humps are separated by more than one millimeter in duration, and there is accentuated negative component of V1 and it usually shows, shows more than one millimeter width and more than one millimeter depth. So lift atrial enlargement shows P wave duration more than one millimeter between the two notched peaks and so the total duration of the P wave is more than 120 millisecond and the interval between the two humps is more than one millimeter or in V1 it can show negative deflection more than one millimeter wide and more than one millimeter deep. And this is the same pattern that we have seen before. What are the famous causes of lift atrial enlargement? Of course, one of the most common causes is mitral stenosis, and this explains why it's a classic terminology is P mitral, but I prefer to use the term lift atrial enlargement because it is a much more broader term that includes other causes, for example, lift ventricular hypertrophy and also lift ventricular diastolic dysfunction. All of this can lead to lift atrial enlargement, and so better to use lift atrial enlargement rather than P mitral, but of course, in many literature, you would read this terminology P mitral. Now we are moving to the other pathology, which is right atrial enlargement. Here, the affection is only in the right atrium, and so the only depolarization affected is right atrial depolarization. So we would use the normal atrial depolarization again and the normal P wave morphologies in lead 2 and lead V1 and use the same vertical line. Here, right atrial depolarization is affected, whereas left atrial depolarization is not affected. And so I could expect that the amplitude of V1 amplitude of P wave in lead 2 would be increased without affection of the duration and also the amplitude of the positive reflection in V1 would be increased without any affection of the negative component and so the P wave amplitude would be more than 2.5 millimeter V2 and more than 1.5 millimeter in V1 and the duration is unchanged. So this is a classic pattern of P of right atrial enlargement which we usually call it P pulmonal increase in P wave amplitude. And here, if we see what is abnormal in this ECG, we could see that the P waves are tall, especially in lead 2 and lead 3 and AVF, and also uh, the positive deflection of uh, the P wave in V1 is accentuated, so this diagnoses right atrial enlargements. Of course, 
the parameters in order to diagnose right atrial enlargement is a P wave amplitude of more than 2.5 millimeter, which is usually more than half large square, and in V1, V2, P wave amplitude would be more than 1.5 millimeter, and this is the same pattern that we have seen before of the right atrial enlargement. And the famous causes of right atrial enlargements are pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary stenosis, and this explains the name of P pulmonal. And there are other causes like tricuspid stenosis, for example, and tricuspid regurgitation as well. And so I prefer to use the term right atrial enlargement rather than the term P pulmonary. But of course, it is a classic term that is written in many literature. And in order not to be confused, right atrial enlargement, right atrial abnormality, left atrial enlargement, left atrial abnormality, both are synonyms for the same pathology. So if you use RAE or RAA, LEE or LAA, they are the same. Some literature prefers the term of enlargement and other literature prefers the term of abnormality. There is like a specific subset of right atrial enlargement, which is rare to see, but it is very characteristic if you by accident saw this pattern in ECG. Sometimes you can see giant P waves more than five millimeter and very peaked in Li2 which is not just an increase in the amplitude of P wave, but it is severe increase in the amplitude of P wave. And that's why it is called Himalayan P waves, referring to the Himalayan mountains in Asia. And this indicates severe right atrial enlargement, like for example, in the restrictive cardiomyopathy, in tricuspid atresia, severe forms of Epstein anomaly, in which there is like apical displacement of the tricuspid valve and atrialization of a portion of the right ventricle, and in patients with COPD complicated by severe pulmonary hypertension. So for example, here we could see that there is an increase in the amplitude of P wave more than five millimeter in the limb leads and in EVR as well there is an increase in the amplitude of the negative P wave more than one large square and this explain why there is severe right atrial enlargement and this we call Himalayan P wave. Now after we explain the right atrial enlargement and left atrial enlargement what do you expect to find in patients with both right atrium and left atrial enlargement? Sometimes both occur in the same patient. So here both amplitude and duration will be increased and also the negative component would be accentuated in V1. So I could expect that I would see combined right atrial enlargement and left atrial enlargement in the same patient. So the duration is increased, amplitude is also increased. So for example here I could see an increase in the P wave amplitude, I could see increase in the P wave duration, I could see prominent negative component of P wave and I could see increase in the RR interval due to first degree AV block. So here I could see that the patient has right atrial enlargement and left atrial enlargement which we call by atrial enlargement accompanied by first degree heart block in this ECG for example. By atrial enlargement is uh, not uncommon to see in ECG. For example, in a, a patient has mitral stenosis and it was long-standing neglected mitral stenosis and complicated by pulmonary hypertension, you would see left atrial enlargement due to the mitral stenosis itself and right atrial enlargement due to development of pulmonary hypertension. If a patient has a rheumatic heart disease with combined mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis, from the start you could see right atrial enlargement due to the tricuspid stenosis and left atrial enlargement due to the mitral stenosis. So it is not uncommon to see that the P wave duration and amplitude both are increased due to biatrial enlargement. So to summarize here, what are the normal features of a P wave as we saw in Li2? Usually it is less than 2.5 millimeter in amplitude and the duration less than 120 millisecond and in V1 I could see a normal biphasic component with the negative component less than 1 millimeter depth and width. In case of left atrial enlargement duration is increased in Li2 I could see two humps separated by more than 1 millimeter time interval and in V1 the negative component would be more than 1 millimeter wide and 1 millimeter deep. In right atrial enlargement, the amplitude is increased without affection of the duration. So in lead 2, it would be more than 2.5 millimeter. In lead V1, it would be more than 1.5 millimeter. And in case of combined left atrial or right atrial enlargement, or we call bi atrial enlargement, both duration and amplitude would be increased in this patient. So remember, ECG, of course, is an initial test that suggests chamber enlargement, but of course you will need an echocardiography to confirm this finding. So in case of presence of left atrial enlargements, I need to check in the echocardiography left atrial dimensions, left atrial area or left, volume, left atrial volume index, and if I saw 
right atrial enlargement in the ECG. I need to check in the echocardiography the right atrial dimension and right atrial area. So left atrial enlargement and right atrial enlargement are like, like preliminary diagnosis from the ECG that need to be confirmed by the transthoracic echocardiography. So at the end of our lecture today, we understood why the P wave is normally biphasic in V1 leads, as we explained in the ECG interpretation lectures today, we explained this theory in detail regarding the normal atrial depolarization and normal parameters of P wave, and also we understood how to detect and diagnose right atrial enlargement and left atrial enlargement in the ECG and what are the parameters to diagnose them. Before we end our lecture, I need to give you some take-home messages from our lecture today. Left atrial enlargement is a matter of increased P wave duration and accentuated negative component of P wave, whereas right atrial enlargement is a matter of increased P wave amplitude rather than duration. Thank you very much for your listening, and we are going to meet in the second lecture of the chamber enlargement regarding ventricular enlargement. Thank you.